Hey guys, welcome to our uh, cell biology presentation for pre-AP biology. All right, so we're going to be diving into the world of cells lecture. And the first thing I want to talk about is levels of organization. As you can see here, uh, life sort of is made up of different levels of organization. Atoms are the basic unit of which all things are made up of. And when atoms come together, they come together to make things like molecules. Uh, water is a good example of a molecule. It is one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms that have come together. Many of these large complex molecules and simple molecules will then come together to make up an organelle, which is a subset or a part of the cell. And then many organelles together make up the cell. Many cells together can make up a certain type of tissue, such as muscle tissue or liver tissue or brain tissue. Those tissues come together to make up organs, which are made up of many different types of tissue. And of course, many organs together make up an organ system, and different organ systems come together to finally make up the organism. We're going to be studying the level of the cell today, and this is an example of what we call emergent properties. What do I mean by that is the word emergent means to emerge, come from. So just like uh, going back to our water example, we have an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Alone, they have certain properties on their own. But we put those together, we now have a water molecule, which has very different properties than the oxygen molecule and the hydrogen molecules have on their, on their own. I should say hydrogen and oxygen atoms. The same thing with the cell. Each organelle has specific properties, but when we put all those organelles together, we now have something that is completely different, a functioning living organism, a cell that has many more different properties than the individual organelles themselves did. Again, that is a property we call emergent. All right, the first thing we want to talk about is cell theory. It basically consists of three different parts. The first part basically says all organisms are comprised of one or more cells. Now, single-celled organisms can be both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Most eukaryotic organisms, however, are multicellular, although there are many unicellular uh, composed of one cell eukaryotic organisms. Cells are the smallest unit of life. That's number two. With, uh, we, do, we have not yet found anything that is smaller than a cell that we can consider living. And we also say that all cells come from pre-existing cells. And we're going to talk about abiogenesis, or the formation of the first cells with, from non-living components, a little bit later on in the year. But for now, let's just say that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Uh, one thing we need to know is that cells are an open system and versus a closed system. What does that mean? That just basically means that cells interact with their surrounding environment. A closed system does has no environment and everything is enclosed within that system. There's no movement of things into or out of that particular system. In a cell, which is an open system, there's going to be movement of nutrients into the cell and waste products and out of the cell. There, there will be other things moving out of the cell, such as uh, protein products that are manufactured in the cell, destined for other places, other cells, uh, other organs in, in a multicellular organism, and so on. But the cell is in an open system. Our planet Earth is also an open system. We have a continual influx of energy from the sun, and that energy gets brought into our system via the process of photosynthesis and eventually leaves our system in the form of heat. But uh, the earth is also an open system. The cell is an open system. Your body is an open system. In order to see and study cells, we need some special tools, okay? And some of these tools you are all already familiar with, such as the microscope. But we have to go back in time, uh, back into the mid-1600s when 
two scientists, uh, opticians, one of them, basically designed some of the first useful and powerful microscopes. Robert Hooke came up with the first compound microscope. That means it consists of two or more lenses. And Antoine von Leeuwenhoek uh, came up with a very simple microscope, which is basically a uh, magnifying glass, but it, he was an incredible optician, and his uh, magnifying glasses were able to magnify objects up to 200 times. And they were uh, uh, just uh, fantastic compared to the contemporary uh, microscopes and magnifying glasses of their time. So these guys were making the best products, and they were able to draw some incredible uh, diagrams of what were then called animacles, or uh, you know, basically little tiny living organisms that nobody knew even existed. And so these guys were sort of uh, known as the father of, fathers of cytology, or the study of cells. Okay. Well, today we use a couple of different types of microscopes. Uh, one that we will be using is called the light microscope, and uh, basically uses light in order to look at an object. And a couple of terms you need to know here is resolving power. And as I, you can read there, it's a measure of image clarity. It's basically when you look at, at uh, through the microscope is what is the minimum distance that two points can be apart that they can still be viewed as two separate points. So if something gets really small and they're really close together, the light wave wavelength is actually larger than the distance between those two objects and we can no longer use a light microscope to look at those two objects because the light wave is actually too big to separate the two and that's what we call resolution and resolving power microscope we can get down to about two microns which is two millionths of a meter apart uh, take a meter stick and divide it by a million times and that's what a micron is Another word you might hear for that is a micrometer or a micrometer, but microns are the word we like to use. Uh, a good light microscope, not the ones we have in our classroom, but a good one can magnify up to about a thousand times the actual specimen. The ones we have, eh, we'll say about maybe a hundred times, maybe 400 times. But uh, as you can look at the graphic over on the right-hand side, you can see with the unaided eye, you can see down to, oh, about one uh, 100 mic microns uh, with a light microscope you can see all the way down to oh maybe about um, you know a little bit less than one micron as I said two microns is the max and then we have our other type of microscope called the electron microscope which instead of using light as light wavelengths it uses electron beams and we can see a lot smaller objects with that so there are two types of electron microscope one is called a transmission electron microscope, and it is used to look at the internal structure of a cell or an object. Another type of electron microscope is called a scanning electron microscope, and this is looking at the surface of an object. There are some fantastic uh, scanning electron microscope uh, images that if you just uh, do a Google search on those, you'll see some really cool things, especially of like insects and things of that nature. But uh, the drawback of both of these types of microscopes is that you need to kill the organism. They can only be used on dead cells. The other drawback of electron microscopes is they're large and very, very expensive. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, light microsco microscopy, on the other hand, we can use on living cells, so we can actually watch uh, living processes occurring uh, with the microscope. Relatively inexpensive, anywhere from you know maybe a couple hundred dollars for the microscopes that we have in our classroom to several thousand dollars for a good one, and they're uh, pretty transportable as they are relative. And um, looking at cells. We need to understand, of course, cells are small, and they're small for a reason. The reason they're small is because cells need to move things from one side of the cell to the other. And most of that is done by the process of diffusion, uh, which is basically the movement from a high concentration to a low concentration. 
and uh, diffusion is a relatively slow process. So if a cell is too big, it just won't be able to work fast enough in order to move materials from one side to the other. So cells like to be small. The other reason why cells need to be small is they have to move material into the cell, and uh, such as nutrients and food and oxygen and things of that nature, and they have to get waste products out of the cell, things like nitrogenous waste, CO2, and so on. And we have to look at it, the surface area or the cell membrane of a cell is basically a door. The more surface area you have per unit volume, the more doors you have going into the cell. So if we look at the diagram up here, you see a cell that has a unit length of one on one side, and then you see a larger cell that has a unit length of five. So what's the surface area of that small cell with a unit of one? Well, it's simply going to be one times one, which equals one for the surface of one side of that cube. Now, how many sides of the cube are there? There's going to be six sides to the cube, four sides, a top and a bottom. So the surface area is going to be basically six times the surface area of one of those sides of cubes. So six times one equals six. What's the volume? Volume is length times width times height. So that's going to be one times one times one. So our surface area to volume is going to be six to one because volume was one times one times one, which equals one. So we basically have six doors for every one unit of volume going into that cell. So it works very efficiently. Now, if we look at the larger cell with five units on a side, what's its surface area? It's going to be one side of the cube is five times five or 25 times six times of that cube. That equals 150. That's its surface area. What's its volume? It's five times five times five, which is 125. What's its surface area to volume ratio? That's simply 150 divided by 125 equals 1.2. So as you can now see, there are, are only 1.2 doors for every one unit of volume going into this particular cell. So it's not as efficient at, as moving things in and out of that cell. Also, it's much bigger, so therefore it would take a lot longer once something got into that cell to go from one side to the other. And if you look at the cell on the far right, it's the same size. It's 5 by 5 by 5, but it is divided up into a whole bunch of smaller cubes, 125 to be exact. Okay, so our surface area, if I took every one of those cubes, the surface area going back earlier was 6. 6 times 125 equals 750. That's my surface area. My total volume is basically 1 times 125 or, or 125. 750 divided by 125 gives me 6 again, the same number as we saw in with the very uh, first small cube. So it also has a very efficient uh, surface area to volume ratio. So cells want to be small. Okay, so two main types of cells that we're going to be talking about are prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Uh, they all are, they're different from each other, but they show a lot of unity, meaning that they share a lot of uh, uh, characteristics. And the four characteristics that they do share is one, they are surrounded by a plasma membrane. All cells are surrounded by a plasma membrane. Uh, all cells have some form of cytoplasm or cytosol, which contains uh, the proteins, the ribosomes, and in some cells, organelles and things of that nature. All cells contain chromosomes, which, are, which is basically DNA. Okay, prokaryotic cells have a single circular chromosome, and eukaryotic cells have multiple linear chromosomes. And of course, all cells have ribosomes, which are tiny organelle-like structures that basically build proteins. They, uh, they are, however, uh, they are not surrounded by a plasma membrane as the other organelles are. So as I said earlier, we talked about cell surface area to volume ratio. The plasma membrane acts as a barrier that allows the passage of oxygen nutrients into the cell and waste out of the cell. And it's a selective barrier, and we're going to talk a lot more about that uh, in lecture uh, two.
one of the main differences we see between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is that the prokaryotic cell does not have a nucleus. The DNA is in what we call the nucleoid region. It's basically just the part of the cell where the, new, the DNA is wrapped up very tightly. Remember, in a prokaryotic cell, such as a bacterium, the DNA is a single circular chromosome. In a eukaryotic cell, the chromosomes are contained within a nucleus, and this has many different functions. One is to help protect that million-dollar blueprint. So coming back to our bacterial cells, once again, they are simple cells. They're extremely small. They have no membrane-bound organelles. They consist, again, of a single circular chromosome. They do have ribosomes. They have cytoplasm, and of course, as we mentioned earlier, they do have a uh, plasma membrane. Bacteria also have a cell wall. Now, when we get up into our more complex eukaryotic cells, a couple of different things going on here. First of all, eukaryotic cells, you are composed of eukaryotic cells. Your dog is, your cat is, your trees and plants. Basically, everything you can see with your naked eye is a is, or I should say every living thing you can see with your naked eye is composed of uh, eukaryotic cells. And uh, one of their main characteristics is that they are much larger than a prokaryotic cell, uh, usually about 100 times larger. The other thing that's uh, characteristic of eukaryotic cells is that they have this very extensive internal membrane system which divides the cell into multiple compartments. And these multiple compartments allow for different local environments within a particular cell, which is going to allow for very specific functions in each one of these little mini tiny environments. And guess what these environments are called? You guessed it, organelles. Animal cell does lack a couple of things down here. It, does, it lacks chloroplasts. It lacks a large central vacuole, and it lacks a cell wall, and it lacks things called plasmodesmata in uh, transport in plant cells. Here's a typical plant cell, and the same thing goes for the plant cell, as I said about the animal cell. Not all plant cells have all the parts, and so on and so on. Like a root cell would not have chloroplast because it doesn't see any light. Um, but a couple of different things that make a plant cell different. First of all, it is surrounded by a cell wall, and uh, it lacks a few things that um, uh, animal cells do have, such as lysosomes, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit later, and centrioles. Uh, now, um, plant cells also have a large central vacuole. You can see that kind of big, uh, clear-like structure in the middle. And its main role is to uh, play a role in water balance in a plant cell and plays a role in whether or not that plant is uh, like wilts. Like if you notice, if you don't water your plants, they wilt. That's because the large central vacuole has lost water and that causes the cell walls to sort of collapse a little bit. It's kind of like an almost like an internal skeleton, if you will, because if it, when it's full, it's pushing against the cell walls. And that allows the cell walls to be rigid and the plant is not wilted. So it's kind of cool the way that all works together. And he's, as you can see on the bottom, they have a plasmodesmata, which uh, basically are channels or holes in a cell wall that do connect one plant cell from the other. Things like water and chemical messages and things of that nature will pass through those uh, plasmodesmata. All righty. So... Um, all cells have DNA, and as I said earlier, in uh, the eukaryotic cells, that DNA is enclosed with uh, inside a nucleus, which is a double membrane-like structure called a nuclear envelope. And a, just like the uh, plant cell wall, there are little holes in that nuclear envelope called nuclear pores, which allow for uh, de uh, allow for things like messenger RNA and um, different types of chemical messages to move in and out of that nucleus. Now, the nucleus also contains something else called the nucleolus, which is where ribosomes are made, and we'll get into that once again. Now, there's a lot of DNA in a uh, cell. Inside of every single one of your cells, there's about two meters. That's like oh, six and a half feet of DNA, you know, inside your cell. And you have 
hundred, you have trillions of cells in your body. So we're talking about trillions of meters of DNA, which is like from here to Jupiter and back a couple of times. You have a lot of DNA. Now, uh, the DNA is fits in there by being wrapped very tightly around these little protein spools, kind of like uh, the way thread is wrapped on a spool for uh, if your mom sews or your dad sews or anything like that. Um, these little protein spools allow for the uh, very um, tight packing of the DNA. This DNA protein mix is known as chromatin, and it's kind of look, look it's kind of uh, loosely packed in the cell membrane uh, within the with, excuse me within the nucleus. However, when a cell begins to divide, that chromatin condenses into chromosomes, which is a much more compact version of that DNA. It just allows for the DNA to be passed from um, one cell to the other without being entangled and uh, being broken and things of that nature. Um, as I said, show you there, each eukaryotic species has a characteristic number of chromosomes. We have, as humans have 46. Uh, fruit flies have eight. Uh, some lily plants, and these are plants, have over a thousand chromosomes. So the number of chromosomes doesn't really indicate complexity of an organism, uh, and we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit more about that in class. You should probably click on that YouTube video and watch it. It's all about how DNA is packed into a cell. Okay. Another thing that all cells uh, share is that all cells have ribosomes, and ribosomes are necessary in order to build proteins, and proteins are basically the uh, the workhorse in your cell. That's your. They play a role in transport, moving things across cell membranes, in movement. Your muscle is all made out of proteins. They play a role in uh, protecting your body against uh, foreign invaders. That's what antibodies are, proteins and things. Uh, they uh, also play a role in catalyzing uh, biological reactions. We call those enzymes, very uh, special proteins. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about enzymes. They basically do everything. So all cells need to have ribosomes, and the ribosomes are made up of RNA plus additional proteins that are wrapped up into that. Okay, so this is our ribosome, and ribosomes play the role of building proteins. And of course, ribosomes are extremely important because proteins are what uh, causes an organism to basically function. They are the workhorses. They play a role in transport across cell membranes. They play a role in the organism moving, such as muscle tissue and things of that nature. They play a role in your uh, immuno defense system. They protect you against invaders. We call those antibodies. Uh, proteins also play a role in uh, catalyzing biological reactions. And these proteins are called enzymes, and we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about enzymes. So ribosomes are basically composed of two parts. They're called uh, a large subunit and a small subunit. And let me show you what those are here in a second. As you can see, our large subunit is the gray on the upper part, and the small subunit is represented by the purplish structure. There's something called a transfer RNA, which we'll get into a little bit later. But basically, the ribosomes do not function until those two units come together on top of a messenger RNA molecule. Then they read the messenger RNA molecule, and uh, they will, from there, um, translate the message, the code in the messenger RNA molecule to build a protein. And if you uh, highlight that link, you can watch the YouTube video there. Uh, showing you that tr that process. Uh, ribosomes can be found in one of two areas, free-floating in the cytoplasm or attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. This is going to end uh, the first part of the lecture, and we're going to jump on to the second part, part 1b, but uh, you don't need to do it all at once. I want you to save it for uh, Tuesday night. All right. Uh, here's lecture part 1b where we're going to start talking more about the specific organelles uh, besides the nucleus and the ribosomes uh, of the cell. So one thing we need to understand, as I said earlier, is that there's in eukaryotic cells we have this internal membrane system. And uh, there's a couple of different um, 
uh, organelles that are all associated with what we call the endomembrane system. The first is the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, which, as you see up here, manufactures membranes and performs many other biosynthetic functions, bio, biological, synthetic, to build. So the endoplasmic reticulum helps to build a lot of different proteins and things and modify those proteins. The Golgi apparatus plays a role in finishing, sorting, and shipping these various proteins to other parts of the cell. Lysosomes are kind of like the garbage truck. They go around cleaning up... Um, and uh, basically recycling damaged cell organelles, old cell organelles, and uh, digesting food. So kind of a role of the garbage truck and the stomach, if you will. And vacuoles have a lot of different roles depending upon wh where they are and what type of cell they are. So getting into the endoplasmic reticulum, again, the ER, uh, short for endoplasmic reticulum, there are two major types, smooth and rough. The smooth uh, lacks ribosomes, and the rough has ribosomes attached to it. And, of course, the ribosomes build proteins, so ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum basically build proteins inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, the endoplasmic reticulum basically goes all throughout the cell, and it's a pathway, if you will, for moving proteins from one part of the cell to the other. So the first of all, talking about the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, its main function is in the synthesis of lipids, which are fats. Okay, the metabolism of CHO, that stands for carbohydrates. Okay, they also play a role in the detoxification of drugs, and we find a lot of this in uh, uh, your liver, because that's what your liver does, it detoxes your blood. And so the cells of your liver have a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And they produce sex hormones, and they can, uh, such as estrogen and testosterone, and they also play a role in the storage of calcium ions, which play a huge role in uh, muscle contraction. And the arrows are pointing to, on the left-hand arrow, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and the right-hand arrow is pointing arrow is pointing to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and those little tiny pepper-like dots are the ribosome. So uh, the way this works is a, um, a, a ribosome uh, will basically, uh, a messenger RNA will attach itself to a ribosome. The ribosome, small and large subunits, will come together around that, um, that messenger RNA. It will start to translate that, uh, that protein message there. It starts to build the protein. And if there's a signal sequence of amino acids, which is what proteins are made up of, uh, that'll basically tell that ribosome to attach itself to, a, uh, to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And when it does that, the rest of the protein will be made. And that protein, as you can see, is being made inside of the endoplasmic reticulum where a lot of different things can happen. It can move from a, it can move to a different part of the cell. It can be modified. Um, it can be cut in half. A lot of different things can happen there. Okay. The Golgi apparatus. And as I say up here, uh, its role is to basically finish a protein. Uh, it's taking the products from the endoplasmic reticulum. It's helping to finish those. Uh, add parts to them, take them apart, add s several proteins together, and then it's going to ship them to wherever it is needed, whether inside the cell, like to a lysosome, or outside the cell to other parts of the body. And as you can see here, uh, the Golgi apparatus kind of looks like a series of flattened pancakes, if you will. And there's a uh, transmission electron microscope picture of one on the right-hand side and a cartoon on the left-hand side. And these little tr uh, transport vesicles will move through the uh, Golgi apparatus, and they're transporting proteins inside of them that came from the endoplasmic reticulum. And as it moves through that Golgi apparatus, those proteins get modified, and then eventually they will get shipped either out of the cell or to another organelle within. So here is the whole picture of protein transport. And again, there's a YouTube link on the bottom that you can click on and watch it. I forget a two to three minute video. But the proteins are going to start um, 
uh, of course, in the endoplasmic reticulum where they've been built. They'll travel to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and put into a transport vesicle. That transport vesicle uh, will move through the Golgi apparatus where those proteins get modified. And then they will get put into what we call a sec secretory vesicle, which will then move to either an organelle, another organelle within the cell, or to the plasma membrane itself where the protein will be expelled. One of the places uh, those, trans those secretory vesicles may move to are lysosomes. And lysosome is uh, basically a uh, digestive sac, a sort of almost a stomach, if you will, of the cell. And their main role is to break down or hydrolyze. Hydro means water. Lyse, L-Y-Z-E, or lyse, L-Y-S-E, means to break apart. So they're using water molecules to actually break apart other types of macromolecules, such as proteins, <clears throat> fats, carbohydrates, i.e. polysaccharides, and nucleic acids. Um, lysosomes are, also have this uh, kind of a moniker called a suicide sac, because if a lot of lysosomes break open simultaneously, that cell will be destroyed. It will undergo a process we call apoptosis, A-P-O-P, T-O-S-I-S, -S, apoptosis, kind of a cool word, and that means programmed cell death. <clears throat> so again, here's our picture of a lysosome, or a little blow pattern, if you will, from the endoplasmic reticulum through the Golgi apparatus, and the lysosomes here are fusing with a food vesicle and causing the breakdown <clears throat> of that food inside that uh, digestive um, uh, vacuole. And we're also seeing lysosomes fusing with a old or damaged organelle, breaking down, <clears throat> breaking down that organelle, and uh, recycling all of the parts in. As I said earlier, vacuoles play a huge role in a lot of a diverse set of roles. Anything from holding food to pumping water to holding water to having color pigments in them, um, all sorts of different roles. Uh, but the as you can see up there, those are some of the rules of vacuoles. They are membrane bound, meaning they are uh, have a phospholipid membrane around. And one of the most important ones we see in a plant is the large central vacuole, uh, which plays a role in keeping that plant cell healthy and turgid. Okay, turgid means there's a lot of internal pressure forcing the cell walls apart, making sure that plant cell is erect and strong. As soon as the uh, plant is under water stress, water leaves that central vacuole, the cell walls collapse, and the plant will actually work. Now, the two really important organelles that uh, we like to deal, talk about that deal with energy transfers are the mitochondria, or the powerhouse of the cell, and the chloroplasts. Now, chloroplasts, of course, are only found in um, organisms that undergo photosynthesis, such as plants and algae, uh, and mitochondria are found in pretty much all organisms. Uh, they're found in plants, and they're found in animals, and protists, and fungi, and everything of that nature. Okay, and again, what mitochondria do is that they basically are going to take molecules such as uh, sugars, and proteins, and fats, and break them down, and create a form of energy that the cell can use as fuel, and that's called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And cells can only use ATP as a form of energy and uh, you know, for, for powering cellular processes, and mitochondria make that ATP, and that's their role. So let's look at the mitochondria first of all. And as you can see, um, the, now again, you might have heard this called the powerhouse of the cell. And the mitochondria is a pretty complex structure. It uh, is a room within a room, if you will. It basically has two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And as you can see, the inner membrane is highly folded. And all of that fold, all those folds basically increase the surface area of the interior part of that cell. Why is that important? Because all of the enzymes that uh, basically control cellular respiration are found on that membrane. The more membrane you have, the more uh, enzymes you have, 
the more efficient you are going to be at doing your job. And in this case, that's taking food molecules like fats and uh, carbohydrates and proteins and converting it into the form of energy that cells use, which is what again? You got it, ATP. Those membranes on the inside are called cristae, and the fluid in between those membranes are called, is called the matrix. Okay, and we'll be talking a lot about that. Now, um, this membrane within a membrane we'll talk a little bit about later, but it's it's kind of a piece of, one of the pieces of evidence that we have of something called endosymbiosis. Endo means within, symbiosis means to live together. And um, scientists hypothesize that uh, mitochondria were once free-living uh, bacteria that became engulfed by a early um, cell to eventually become our eukaryotic cells. And we believe this process happened somewhere about 1.5 billion years ago. Okay. And... What's some of the evidence we have of this is that, well, both mitochondria and chloroplasts are not part of the endomembrane system. They both have their own DNA, and their DNA is in the form of a single circular chromosome, which is the same as a bacterium. Uh, they divide independently of the cell, and um, so those are, again, some of the pieces. Very similar to mitochondria in that we have a room within a room. We have the inner membrane called the thylakoid membrane, and then we have this outer membrane, and the fluid surrounding the inner membrane is called stroma. Okay, so that is um, the fluid surrounding that, and the chloroplasts, of course, are going to convert light energy into chemical energy in the form of sugar in the process of photosynthesis, and we'll spend some more time with that later on. Okay. Um, peroxisomes are another type of uh, uh, um, plastid that play a role in converting um, hydrogen peroxide, which is a breakdown of proteins and fats. As it's, just, it's a product of protein and lipid breakdown. And uh, hydrogen peroxide, of course, is very um, poisonous to the body, so we need to get rid of it pretty quick. And there's an enzyme called catalase that actually converts the hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen gas, and we'll actually be doing some labs with that. Okay, so what holds this whole cell together? Well, the cytoskeleton. Remember that word cyto, a cytologist studies cells. Well, cyto means cell, skeleton, that's the skeleton, the cytoskeleton means skeleton of a cell, okay? And this is not like our skeletons, which are rigid. This is a very dynamic system. The cytoskeleton forms and reforms and breaks down and reforms. It does all sorts of different things throughout our body. And they play a huge role in making the cell move, helping support the cell, allow for transport across the cell by some motor proteins and things of that nature, and help to move chromosomes around during cell development. Okay? So again, those are all some of the different types of functions of the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is composed of three different elements. We have microtubules, which are the largest of the cytoskeletal elements, and these play a role in uh, moving the chromosomes around and structure and things of that nature. Uh, they're made up of a type of protein called tubulin, and um, our next uh, largest is called an intermediate fiber. Makes sense. It's intermediate between that and the smallest fibers called uh, the actin filaments or uh, microfilaments is another word for those. So we have our three different sizes. We have the largest, the microtubule, medium, the intermediate fiber, and the smallest called the microfilaments. Okay. As I said earlier, plays a role, major role in cell movement and it does interact with motor proteins, and we have a cool little uh, video on that on the next slide. And uh, what causes these motor proteins to move? It's going to be ATP. And where did the ATP come from again, guys? You got it, the mitochondria. All right, so um, basically, uh, microtubules are 
can also play the role as highways within the cell. And there are little, little motor proteins that actually move along these things like a roadway. They basically walk down these microtubules and they'll be carrying things like uh, vacuoles on top of them. Where in this little diagram it says organelle. You should click on the play button up there to see the movie. I'm not going to do that right now, but you should go ahead and do that while you watch uh, before you move on to the next slide. Microtubules are made up of uh, are made up of proteins. Okay, so the proteins are these which are called tubulin, and many many of these tubulins come units come together to build these microtubules. And we'll see a video in class that shows uh, the building of one of these. Um, uh, animal cells have these things called centrosomes. As you can see, uh, they are made up of microtubules, and they play a, uh, a role in cell division. Uh, plant cells don't have them, but animal cells do. And of course, you're pro you are probably familiar with cilia and flagella. They're both kind of very similar in terms of their structure. They're made up of microtubules, and they have the same structure. They consist of nine pairs of microtubules with two in the middle. And we'll see a picture of that in a second. And they basically play a role in um, movement. Uh, flagella basically play a role in moving the whole organism throughout the uh, a medium, such as water. Cilium can do two. Cilia can do two different things. They can help an organism move through a watery environment, or they can move objects and things along the outer surface of a cell. You have cilia all up and down your, in your respiratory tract which um, move mucus and things like that uh, up and down that respiratory. So here's our structure of a microtubule, and there's our, as you can see in the top middle picture, we have uh, nine pairs of tubules and two in the middle. Okay, so that is the structure there. That's kind of cool. I'm not going to say much more about that. And again, the way a flagella moves is going to be uh, through the addition or subtraction of phosphate groups that come from ATP. And where does ATP come from again, guys? You got it, the mitochondria. Um, microfilaments play a huge role in muscle movement. Uh, we'll look at a video about that in class. But uh, it's basically two different types of proteins. We have actin and myosin. Uh, myosin is the motor protein. Actin are the microfilaments. And they work together to make your muscles contract and to relax. Plants also have this moving going, movement going on. And this is called cytoplasmic streaming. Uh, it's actin and myosin that are basically helping to move things around uh, a plant cell. And uh, we'll see some videos of that also in class. Now, one of the things that we see with plant cells that um, animal cells do not have is the fact that they have this cell wall. Cell walls are also found in other organisms, such as um, pro, uh, bacteria, although the cell wall is very different. Fungi, mushrooms have cell walls, and many different types of protists, which are uh, eukaryotic organisms, as are fungi. Uh, that are generally single-celled organisms. Now, the cell wall could be made, at, made up of different types of things, such as silica, but in uh, plants, the cell wall is made up of carbohydrates, i.e. sugars, and it's called cellulose, which is basically wood. And cellulose is a sugar molecule, a whole bunch of them. Now, cell walls in plants consist of uh, three parts. We have a primary cell wall, a middle lamella, which is composed of these sticky sugars that basically holds the two parts together. And then we have our um, secondary cell wall. And that can sort of grow, and you can just see that right there in the diagrams. Now, it's very difficult for materials to move between cells. And again, we have these plasmodesmata, uh, which are little passageways, little holes, if you will, between uh, the cell walls that allow the movement of water and nutrients between. Now, animal cells um, have this thing called an extracellular matrix, or an ECM, surrounding the cell. And 
it basically, as it you know, plays a role in support, adhesion, movement, and regulation of that particular cell. It's made up of a whole bunch of proteins, and I should, you see the word glycoprotein up here. Glyco means sugar. So these are protein molecules that have little sugar or carbohydrates stuck on them. You might have heard of collagen. That's the stuff that, you know, the um, movie stars and things like that will uh, basically uh, inject into their lips and things. It's also what gives your skin its elasticity. Okay, so um, of those uh, different types of glycoproteins uh, and proteins that are embedded in this extracellular matrix, and uh, we see microfilaments of the cytoskeleton that might be attached to these. And so if something bumps into the cell, it can actually send a signal down through the cell into these microfilaments, uh, which then can cause something to happen within. So as I said earlier, um, you know, we talked about the plasma desmata that allows for the transfer of information from one uh, plant cell to another. Well, animal cells also have little junctions between them, and there are basically three different types of junctions. We have desmosomes, gap junctions, and tight junctions. Desmosomes play a role in basically holding together two different cells, like, look, as we say, like rivets here, or like a nail or a screw holding together two different cells. Gap junctions play the role in communication, so they communicate. They allow for messages to move between one animal cell to the next and generally they have to travel through a special protein molecule in order to get into the cell leave the cell and to get into the cell and tight junctions are basically play a role, um, like a waterproof junction between cells and here's a diagram showing you a tight junction which basically seals two cells close together we see that up here. We see the uh, desmosomes, which help to play a role in anchoring the cell um, from one cell to another cell. And the gap junctions, which are these channels down here in the lower part of the cell that allow for the passage of um, uh, messages and things of that nature from one cell to the next. Okay? And so, uh, just again, they help to integrate the cells into higher levels of structure and function. So instead of a cell just acting on its own, it's acting in uh, conjunction or coordinating with other cells. And so the organism can have uh, respond to the environment. In the so as I said, um, a cell is uh, the emergent properties and it's a living unit greater than the sum of its parts. All those parts come together to make this uh, to give new structure and new functions to this, to these once disparate uh, structures, these organelles, when they work together, they can create have new functions. Okay, so all structures, all organelles work together. All processes within the cell require energy in the form of ATP, again supplied by the mitochondria, and all of the cell's processes are coordinated by DNA which is stored in the nucleus, that million dollar blueprint, and the information gets transferred to the cell via the process of um, messenger RNA, and eventually that messenger RNA gets turned into proteins. Those proteins are messages, which then coordinate functions within the cell. Proteins, of course, are built by the ribosomes, and lysosomes play a role in food digestion. And if you want to check out some videos, there's a couple of videos there you can look on to uh, check it out or we will look at those in class and that's it guys hope you enjoyed our lecture